I freely confess to you today that I grew up in a church where we did not observe uh, a lot of the higher church kinds of customs. Uh, the church that I grew up in, we never had candles on the altar table, for instance. We didn't have a Bible on the altar table. There was nothing on the altar table until it was time for communion. I did not know what Advent was when I was a child. I did not know what Lent was when I was a child. I have found a lot of encouragement in the observance of some of the higher church kinds of things. And today is a special day in the life of the church. It's the last Sunday in the church year. Next year is new, next Sunday is New Year's Day. It's the first Sunday of Advent for us. This Sunday, some years, does not get to be observed. It is Christ the King Sunday. It is the last Sunday in the church year, and the reason I say it doesn't get to be observed is sometimes it's so close to being the Sunday before Thanksgiving that that consumes us. And I understand that. It is wonderful today to set aside a day when we recognize and realize that Jesus is not just our Savior, but also our King. And today is that day in Christ the King Sunday. If you have your Bible, turn there to John chapter 3, a very familiar passage of Scripture, and we'll read the first 21 verses of that chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. You've heard me preach from this text of scripture before. 
And if I live long enough, you'll hear me preach from this text of Scripture again, I suspect, because it is such a rich text. We used to say in seminary it was a pregnant text. It's ready to give birth. And that literally is true here in this text when we're talking about the new birth. We are introduced in the early part of this chapter to a man named Nicodemus. He is a ruling elder in Israel. He is one of the members of the Sanhedrin. He is a powerful man among the Jews. And he comes to Jesus at night. Now we can speculate as to why, why does he come to Jesus at night. And we don't, the answer really is we don't know. Does he come to Jesus at night because he doesn't want to be seen by anybody else? You know, there's some sense of privacy in the night. They had these little tiny oil lamps that were no bigger around than that, where you put olive oil in one side and a wick in the other, and you would light it. You can imagine it's about as much light as a candle. And they would have a little disc and a handle on it, and they would lower that down to their feet so that they could see where they were going at night. You could hide yourself pretty well in the night. Does Nicodemus come to Jesus at night because he is ashamed and doesn't want other people to see him as he's coming to inquire of Jesus as to who he is and why he is there? That's one possible theory. Another is, is he comes to Jesus at night because Jesus is hugely popular and people are just gathering around him and there's no opportunity perhaps to have the kind of intimate conversation with Jesus if he approaches him during the daytime. That's another theory. We don't really know why Nicodemus comes but come he does and when he comes to Jesus he he flatters him as we often do people who are of some importance to us we say complimentary things to them surely you are Israel's teacher for we have heard you teach but that's not why he's come he's come to inquire is what I'm doing enough? <laughs> Isn't that really the question that each of us want to have answered? Is what I'm doing enough? And the answer is this. No matter what you're doing, it's never enough. Because you and I cannot earn our way into heaven. It's a gift. It's not an outcome of our wages. It's a gift that God freely gives. And so Jesus begins in his conversation with Nicodemus this wonderful intercourse, this wonderful dialogue that we have read and heard about so many times and perhaps we ourselves have had a similar kind of dialogue with Jesus. And Jesus says something to Nicodemus that apparently is shocking to him. And when Jesus says to him, you must be born again. We know in the physical world that makes no sense whatsoever. How can a man who was old enter his mother's womb a second time? That's just not possible. You must be born again. Not born of the flesh, but instead born of the Spirit. You must be born again. Nicodemus is struggling with this. He's not really sure where this is going. He's not quite understanding. You know, I've been a good Pharisee all of my life. I've given a tenth of all that I have to the Lord. In fact, Sometimes I give more than my tenth. I observe the, the celebrations in the synagogue and in the temple. 
I do all that I am supposed to do. And Jesus says to us, it's not enough. You must be born again. And then he shares this wonderful illustration from the book of Numbers. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now every Israelite should know the story of the wilderness journey. The 40-day journey that took 40 years. When I was studying Hebrew, I was convinced it's because they couldn't read the maps. Our professor used to say you could tell a first-year Hebrew student from a second-year Hebrew student because in the second year, they knew whether the page was right side up or upside down. First year, you weren't sure. No, it's this story of when they're in this journey and they begin grumbling and complaining. <laughs> Not that any of us would. They begin grumbling and complaining against the Lord and the Lord says, you want something to grumble and complain about? Let me give you something. And he sends venomous snakes among them and they are bitten and some die. And so now the Israelites, instead of saying, hey, what have we done wrong here? Help us out of this. They go to Moses and they complain to him. And Moses goes on their behalf to the Lord and says, Lord, what, what must I do? And he said, you have someone fashion a snake of bronze and put it on a stick and hold it up. And then when they are bit, if they look at the snake and believe, they will be healed. Do we realize that our medical signs today, the caduceus, is a direct correlation to this story in scripture? If you look at the snake and believe, you will live. And then Jesus says, for just in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up. You see, the moment that Jesus becomes our Savior is the moment he goes to the cross. When Jesus is lifted up, his coronation moment, his kingly moment, is not when the crowd stands and cheers and shouts as they're putting the crown of gold on his head, but instead as he's lifted up on that cross and the crown of thorns is put on his head, it is at that moment when Jesus is our Savior. The work of salvation is won for us on the cross. Jesus' last word from the cross gives us an indicator of that. It is finished. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now this is Christ the King Sunday. Many of us want to ask Jesus to be our Savior, but we want to still make the choices for our life. Okay Jesus, I want you to pull me out of the fire right at the end, but let me pick what I will do. It seems to me when we do that, we cut Jesus in two. We want him to be Savior, but we don't want him to be our King. 
quite a number of years ago I was preaching in a church and there was a very godly man in that congregation and I had preached this message and I had given an altar call you've heard me do that many many times and this very godly man steps out and comes forward and kneels at the prayer rail and I'm thinking to myself my goodness I wonder what's going on and so I went and I knelt beside him and I said how can I pray with you and he said I need to do this on a regular basis because I surrender my life to God and then I pull it back and I pull it back and I pull it back I want to be in charge instead of letting Jesus be in charge and he said Jesus does a whole lot better job than I do but somehow or another, I think I know better at times than what Jesus does. <coughs> Who of us could say any different? If you've ever been prompted by the Lord to do something and you say, Lord, I really don't want to do that, what you are saying is, I think I know better than you do. And as we heard in the Sunday school this morning, there is a cost of discipleship. <coughs> and that is our life. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. A cross is not an instrument of glory. It's an instrument of shame, suffering, death. And then Jesus shares those wonderful words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many people have come to the Savior because of those, because of that word, because of that verse? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What a gift. I'm sure you're cognizant of this fact that one month from today is Christmas. Some of us want to say, don't remind me. Some of you are here saying, tomorrow's the first day of rifle season. We have to have our priorities after all. And then Jesus goes on to say, for the Son of Man did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that through him that the world would be saved. Far too many times in my ministry I've had someone come to me and say, how can a loving and gracious God send someone to hell? And the answer is, God never sent anyone to hell. Hell is a choice that we make by not choosing Jesus. Because Jesus says, for those who do not choose are condemned already. Condemnation has fallen on all of us. Because of the sin that we inherit and live through life. To not choose Jesus is to choose hell. You know, there have been a few times in my life when I've gone to the election polls to vote. And I've been tempted just to say, I'm not going to vote. I have to vote. I have to choose. Sometimes I don't like the choices I have to make, but I have to choose. 
But I promise you, the choice of choosing Jesus is a decision you will never regret. You know, I love those uh, bumper stickers that we see out there, and we've seen them for the last 30 years. Don't blame me, I voted for Bush. Don't blame me, I voted for Clinton. Don't blame me, I voted for Obama. Don't blame me, you know, so on and so on and so on. The issue is, blame me because I have sinned. But I am forgiven because Christ is my King. So, is this the end of the story? No. Nicodemus leaves. And we don't have any resolution on this. It doesn't tell us in this third chapter of John that Nicodemus falls on his knees and confesses Christ as his Savior. That would be nice. But it doesn't tell us that in this story. So is there a resolution? Absolutely. At the very end of John chapter 19, we see Nicodemus again. Jesus has been crucified. And a man named Joseph of Arimathea comes and requests the body. And with him is Nicodemus, who brings 75 pounds of ointment to prepare the body for burial. Do you know why he brings 75 pounds? 75 pounds is the amount that is used to bury a king. We have our answer. We have our answer. Sometimes our testimony should be not just with our mouth, but with our actions. When I was a kid in Good News Club, we used to sing this song, Do you know, O Christian, you're a sermon in shoes. Some people will read our walk before they'll listen to our talk. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Have you wrestled with Jesus recently? Have you said, yes, Lord, but? We all do at times wrestle that same way. And sometimes people who wrestle with God walk with a limp. We know that in Jacob's story. He walked with a limp for the rest of his days when he wrestled with God. We overcome every obstacle of our life through Jesus. Even the ones that doesn't seem like we've overcome, we overcome through Jesus. He gives us grace sufficiently for what it is that we are dealing with at any given moment in our life. There have been a few times in my life where I have wished I could go back and do something differently. I don't suppose any of the rest of you have ever had a moment like that.
I visited a man in the hospital in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, whom I had never met before. And I walked into his hospital room, and that's a bit of an intimidating thing sometimes, where you walk into a complete stranger, if you will. I introduced myself. He didn't seem very happy to see me. I tried to carry on conversation. He was unwilling. I finally said, I'm going to read some scripture and pray. And so I did. I, I read something. I couldn't tell you this day what it was. Read something in the scriptures, probably the Psalms. That's where I go to most of the time. And I prayed for this man. And I left. I said goodbye. He didn't acknowledge that. I got to the elevator and I pushed the button and the Lord said, go back. And I said, oh Lord, I have lots of things on my agenda today. I'll stop by tomorrow. You already know the end of this story. Before the next day had dawned, he died. I do not know what would have happened had I gone back. I do not know whether God sent someone else. And the man believed. I do not know if the man believed. I do know that I was disobedient. When Christ the King asks of his subjects something to do, it would do well for us to say, here I am. Send me. I've confessed that to God. And I've asked God to forgive me of my disobedience. And I know that he has. But the memory of that does not pass from my memory. And it comes back. When Christ is asking of you something, you would do well to say, here am I. Said me. It's much easier to say, Lord, I'll get to it tomorrow. And you know, I, I think in my heart that I had good intentions of getting to it the next day. But the next day never came. And my soul has been troubled. for a very long time. Overcoming through Jesus is the only resolution that you and I can have. You know, I'm so glad that John doesn't tell me the resolution of Nicodemus there in that third chapter. I'm so glad he makes me wait to the end of the book, the 19th chapter, to tell me that Nicodemus comes with 75 pounds. 
of ointment. Because he's come. Because Jesus is the king. Is Jesus your king? I think probably everybody here has asked Jesus to be their savior. Is he your king? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for who you are. Lord, you know it's not my desire to make anyone feel guilty today. I don't have that power. I'm here today because you have given me a message. And I want to share it even to the depth of my troubles. And I am completely reliant upon you for the forgiveness that you have given to me, to Nicodemus, and to countless others. Oh Lord, thank you this day that Jesus is King. Amen. If you have business to, with the Lord today, I want you to know that this prayer rail is open. And I want you to know that you are welcome to come anytime and pray. And one of the elders or I will come and pray with you. I'll try not to breathe on you, but be glad to pray with you.